Ladies and gentlemen, can I first of all thank the CBI very warmly for the invite. Uh, thank John in, in particular for his, his speech. Uh, it presents me with a bit of a dilemma because he actually sort of gave my speech for me, um, <laughs> which means I'm going to have to improvise rather rapidly. But, but actually, I think it's a, on balance a good thing because we are uh, speaking from the same hymn sheet. Uh, I think we've got the same messages. Uh, and that's not a coincidence because we've actually worked together very well and many of the ideas which we've developed have come from the CBI and I hope we've fed something back in return. Uh, I'd also like to thank Tata uh, very warmly for uh, sponsoring this and supporting this event. One of the real um, privileges of my job actually has been uh, getting to know the, um, the, uh, the, the head of the, of the Tata group, uh, Ratan Tata, who was a as those of you who know him, is an extraordinarily quiet, courteous uh, man, but driven by a great passion for uh, industry, for engineering, and actually for Britain. And I'm very grateful to him, I think we all should be, for the contribution that he and his group have made to manufacturing industry in this country. Let me turn to the subject matter. Uh, last week uh, I set out in Parliament, then, it, then in a speech, uh, what I mean, what my colleagues in government mean by industrial strategy. I want to add a little bit of uh, flesh to the bones. Uh, but I want to use my own language and, and put the arguments uh, in, in my own way. And the way I would start is by saying that when we talk about business, we're actually talking about very large numbers of very different kinds of companies. Uh, and there's no one size fits all. That's my starting point. We've got about four million plus companies, because many of them are sole traders, many of them are extremely small. Uh, their attitude to a phrase like industrial strategy would probably be, well, what the hell has this got to do with me? You know, I just want to get on, run my business, government, please keep out of the way, as little as tax as possible, a little regulation as possible, banks, please be reasonable, otherwise we're not terribly interested. And that's fine. I mean, that's, for most of British business, that is a perfectly sensible and reasonable agenda. But there are other kinds of companies at the other end of the spectrum who are quite different in character. You know, who, as John explained in his speech, who have a long-term perspective. I came out of an industry where, I mean, I think John cited 20 years as long-term. Actually, they'd have regarded 20 as reasonably short-term. If you're developing a big new uh, gas field, as my company were, you know, you're thinking 30, 40, half a century. That's the kind of time span of planning and of amortizing your assets. Uh, politicians, when we think we're great, you know, when we think five years, I mean, this is, you know, we've got this five-year government, it's an innovation, but actually compared with many companies, this is ridiculously short-term. And so we have a lot of companies, many of them here, who need some clarity, some certainty, some consistency. And a large part of what I think industrial strategy is about is creating a framework within which that can happen. And who also look to government as potential partners who, you know, they're business, they're commercial, they want to get on and do their thing, but they recognize that government does important things affecting their business. It sets the regulation, does training and education, and does procurement, all kinds of things which affect the business, and they'd rather have this in partnership rather than in conflict or random. So industrial strategy comes from an understanding that there are many companies of that kind, I say many of them in this hall, who want that kind of relationship. And I don't see these two different approaches as being in any way in contradiction. You know, there are people in the media, so this isn't a whinge about a journalist, but you know, who, who have been portraying this as some kind of great ideological conflict you know, within the coalition or even in, within my own ministers. Absolute nonsense. We fully understand that business is varied, they've got different needs, and the concept of industrial strategy fits within that breadth of industry experience. And I thought I would sort of tackle head on some of the criticisms that have already been lobbed in our direction. You know, a lot of people react in a kind of visceral way when they 
hear phrases like industrial strategy. And the first one I think uh, both Raf and, uh, and John have partly addressed already is this idea, well, you know, why don't you just leave all this alone, leave it to competitive markets, it'll all get sorted out. Why do we need this thing? an industrial strategy from governments, unnecessary. I think there are two answers to that. First of all, we just look at what our competitors are doing, and examples have been given. You know, most of the successful countries in the world, whether they're the Asian countries like Korea or countries like Germany, even the United States, which ostensibly has a kind of free-for-all, but actually in many key areas extremely well organized and focused and has a very close relationship between federal government and business. They have industrial strategies. They may use different language, but they have it. And we, frankly, I think in the past have been a bit naive in Britain in assuming that this somehow doesn't apply for us and we can be completely purist and ignore what's going on in the rest of the world. We can't. And the second reason is one that, that John used a phrase which was, I think, very helpful. You can either have an industrial strategy by design or by default. Because the government is doing lots of stuff anyway which affects you, you know, like procurement. It can be done completely randomly. Do nothing whatever to have any underlying purpose or support, or it can be done in a more systematic way, and that's what we're talking about. So that's why I don't accept the laissez-faire approach. Right? The second criticism related to that are people who say, well, you know, didn't we have all this nonsense in the 1970s? You know, all this stuff, you know, government poor putting money into business, supporting losers. Now, for goodness sake, we don't want to go back there again. I mean, I, you, you'll have read a lot of that over the last week. Well, of course, it's true, you know, that we've had bad experiences with industry strategy. I, I was there. I saw it. I was actually in my present department briefly at the end of the 1970s, and I saw some of the bad experiences of government throwing money after losers and then throwing even more in order to try and stop them losing and it, it just gave industrial intervention of all kinds a bad name. And then the pendulum swung to the other extreme and it's been pretty much stuck there ever since. Now what is the assurance that people have that we're not going to rediscover the bad habits of the 1970s? I think it's, you know, we do understand that a lot of the technologies of the future we've never heard of. We don't know what they are. We have to approach this with a certain humility. There will be change, there will be markets. We can't predict. And we've got to learn that lesson from the past. And let me just give a few concrete examples which I think will show the way we have to proceed. One of the sectors that we talk about in industrial strategy as having a competitive advantage is life sciences. British Biological Sciences, some brilliant companies doing lots of things. But one of the first dirty jobs that um, I had to do with David Willits, my, the Universities and Science Minister in the department, was dealing with the closure of Pfizer in Sandwich. We didn't stop it. We didn't rush in and say, sorry, this mustn't be allowed to happen, and we're going to give you lots of money to stop closing. We accepted that that was the logic of the market, and we had to help them to adjust. And similarly, we, 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 we've set out a sectoral approach, but we do accept that in future, um, people may be looking at the world in a very different way. Uh, I attended a meeting a couple of um, weeks ago, I think Neil Bentley from the CBI was there, where we were looking at a long-term view, sort of brainstorming about what industry would be looked like in you know, 10, 20, 30 years' time. And somebody made the point that one of the areas, sectors if you like, where Britain is brilliantly successful, probably a world-beating country, is algorithms. Well, there's no algorithm industry. It doesn't exist. There's no algorithm association anywhere. I don't think you have a bit in the CBI for that. But you have these brilliant cryptographers in GCHQ you have lots of people now in the most sophisticated forms of R&D in many of our IT companies, many of them foreign companies, but based here. Uh, we've got those very clever people um, 
some of whom did quite a bit of damage, but nonetheless very clever people in investment banks in, in the city, the quants, very clever, mastered this particularly sophisticated form of mathematics. This is something we do very well. It's an asset, and we're going to turn it to advantage. And let me just give a final example of how we've got to think flexibly and openly, not in sort of narrow, prescribed ways. Uh, I attended a business dinner uh, last week, a group of people who had some kind of background in the textile and garment industries and retailers who, had, who bought from overseas. And they come up to what, what, to my mind, was a rather shocking proposition. They said, look, the British textile and in clothing industry virtually disappeared. These days, only 5% of all garments in British shops are made in Britain. But we think, business people, we can reinvent this industry. As business people, we're not asking you government to come in and subsidize it or protect it. We think there is a business proposition. Logic has, in business has changed. Proximity is now much more important. Speed of delivery is much more important. We think we can set up not just uh, garment making factories, but you know, going back to spinning and weaving and dyeing and all those things that we used to have. And we'll do this as a business proposition, but we want you government to be involved. So not to give subsidies, but you know, there are things which government can do to help because of course a lot of the skills in this old industry disappeared. Somebody's gonna to have to help us retrain them. So there is a role, it may be actually one of these sectors, it isn't listed here, in five years' time will turn out to be textile and garments, back to the 70s, but in a different way, not driven by government. So that's my answer to the second complaint, you know, 1970s revisited. The third complaint is, well, isn't this all about industry and manufacturing and the modern British economy is about lots of other things? Well, actually, I don't make any apology about the fact that one of the things we're doing now is emphasizing how manufacturing is very important to this country. It's only 10% of GDP, but that's pretty meaningless now because of the overlap between manufacturing services. It's terribly important, actually, far more important than that 10%, because that's where we get half of our exports, so we get most of our productivity, uh, it's where we get most of our R&D. But nonetheless, it is still a minority of our own economy, and services, traded services, knowledge-based services, are important too. <coughs> the city is important. And our industrial strategy has got to be broad enough and flexible enough to accommodate that new mix. Industry is important in the traditional sense, manufacturing, but it isn't just about manufacturing. So some of the criticisms, and I, I'm sure they will continue to roll in, but I think we've got good answers, and I think we have thought this through, and I know the CBI has thought this through, because they will be hit from their critics in exactly the same way. So let me just say a little bit more about how we're going to take this on. And I think quite a lot's been said, so I don't need to repeat it all. Uh, we do see the value of a sectoral approach, of saying there are certain things in this country that we do well. We call it comparative advantage or whatever. We, we do these things well, and we want to reinforce them, and we want to support them because they're uh, internationally competitive activities, and they merit... Uh, a backing, not, not subsidy, not protection in the old sense, but, but a partnership arrangement with, 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 with government. And what are these? Well, um, last Tuesday we, we set out in the department a, a, a framework, i would put it more um, precisely than that, of some of the groups of activities that we ought to be looking at seriously if we're going to have a co coherent industrial strategy. And one was in the area of advanced manufacturing, and there are some obvious candidates like aerospace and life sciences and the automotive sector. But I'm sure that if there are any food and drink manufacturers here, they will tell me that their process engineering is at least as advanced as in any other sector of the economy. So let's, I don't want to, I don't want to use these words rigidly. So advanced manufacturing. And then we've got our traded services, which are based on knowledge. I quoted our algorithms a few minutes ago, but creative industries, something we do brilliantly well in this country. You know, music, uh, digital-based industries of various kinds. 
uh, and, and, you know, it isn't one of the items we've listed, but somebody came to me this morning and said, why, why, why isn't tourism there? Actually, it's one of our biggest exports. But certainly, higher education. You know, higher education is a massively important export industry. Not just overseas students, but campuses, um, the business relationship that are now developing between academics and, 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 and people in the big emerging markets. An enormous source of growth and strength for the UK, particularly given the high class of our universities. And then thirdly, a group of activities that we call enabling industries, things which we may not be exporting directly, but which underpin the others. You know, you need to have, as John said, you need to have basic energy infrastructure, absolutely fundamental. The basic digital technologies, construction products, they lie behind the other things. Now, how do we want to progress this? What I think we would, would find useful is to build on some of the rather good structures that we've already got and have come up from the bottom, that have come from you. Um, the Aerospace Leadership Council is a good prototype, a good model. The Automobile Council is another one. I spend a lot of time with them and it's really a, a real success story, thinking about supply chains and how we develop the next high tech um, uh, bits of the automotive sector that the commercial uh, decisions will not produce themselves, like electric cars, for example. Or something I set up with Jeremy Hunt, which was a creative industries council, getting those rather scattered industries round the table. Initially, we weren't sure what we would talk about, but then it became clear they have massive problems with skills and massive problems with bank credit because, of course, they don't have any tangible assets to offer. So it turned out that this was actually a very productive uh, area of conversation. So we want to make it very clear that as these groups are established or operate, they've got to be business-led, absolutely fundamental. Business, business has to want them, otherwise we won't go there. Business has to lead them, uh, and business has to develop them. It's got to be a business-led process. But out of it, we would hope to see you know, a whole series of um, strategy documents, if you like, not in a stylized way, but in a way that hopefully is helpful to you. And I think the aerospace strategy that we were discussing at Farnborough was a very good model of the kind of thing we'd like to see moving out from the other sectors. But again, I stress, I'm sorry to be boring and repetitive, but it's got to be led by you. It's not going to be led by us. Let me just say, finally, that the way I see this industrial strategy developing is doing a whole lot of things we already do better and more coherently. And I think John's been over this agenda, but let me just uh, repeat it. First of all, in terms of technology, we have good institutions. The Technology Strategy Board I think is a, an excellent example. But we want to try to pursue it in a more systematic way. One of the things we've done since we came in just over two years ago is set up this chain of catapults or innovation centers. And it is you know, shamelessly based on learning from other countries. We've seen the way the Germans operate their Fraunhofer centers. And we want the British version of that, not a copy, but learning from their experience. And those centers are now being rolled out across the country. But they've got to be done in a sensible, coordinated way that makes sense in relation to our industrial strategy. We have now, based on the analysis of the Foresight Group and others, putting a lot of money into synthetic biology uh, and sophisticated computing, for example. But there is a, a strategy now behind it. There's a sense of priorities and how our money, our limited amount of money, can be sensibly allocated. The second area where we have to pursue things in a more systematic way is in relation to skills. And I hear what you say about the shortage of engineers. It is absolutely dire. It is a major disadvantage that we suffer from. But we can't turn this round overnight. As you know, you can't train an engineer in a year or two years. That's absurd. And it's working, amongst other things, with the next generation. One of the real bits of encouragement that I've derived from the last few months is to see the impact of our higher education uh, financing changes, which have been very painful, very traumatic politically, on the, in, the, the next intake for the next academic year. And the subject area that has held up better than any other is engineering. 
teenagers have got it. You know, they do understand that actually there is an enormous future in engineering. And they are applying now. You know, the mentality is changing and in a positive way. And we will try to get behind that. That's why we funded you know, 500 masters in, in aeronautic engineering, for example. And we'll, do, we'll try to do more of that kind of thing. And one of the things, again, that I'm proud of having done since I came into this job, of having injected real energy into apprenticeships. And we've massively increased quantity, but of course you will say it's also about quality and business access, all those things are true. What we are doing, and I would keep a careful eye on it, is introducing pilots, pilot scheme for business-led apprenticeships. In other words, the money will not be given to the trainers and the colleges to produce what they want to produce, and you, you take it or leave it. The money is not being directly challenged, channeled, channeled to business to purchase the skills you want and need through the apprenticeship program. The, the, the emphasis is being shifted completely. And I think you'll find, once this pilot is built on, a much, much more business-friendly and targeted approach to apprenticeship training, much more appropriate. And then um, procurement. And, you know, we put our hands up in government. You know, it's been horribly unstrategic in the past. And that's partly for good reason. You know, government's trying to get value for money. We have all these European rules we have to follow. But, I mean, it, it hasn't been very helpful to British industry very often. Uh, purchasing has uh, gone off into the wrong place for the wrong reasons. We need to be more long-term. We need to be more strategic. I know, because I work with my colleagues on this, that gradually the culture in Whitehall is changing. There are areas now where some really interesting Developments are taking place. Just take one example, tunnelling, uh, as a consequence of all the big new investment that's going into railways. We're going, going to the biggest railway revolution for decades is taking place right now. There will be a big demand for people who understand tunnelling technology and all the skills around it. And we've now developed a pipeline working with the industry to help them ensure that there isn't a bottleneck when these tunnels are actually drilled. Uh, we're trying to do similar things with all the big infrastructure projects that are now, albeit slowly, grinding through the system. So I hope that's given you a flavor of uh, how I see industrial strategy, and also for my passion for it. I really believe in this stuff. It isn't just, uh, I'm not just trotting out, you know, uh, cliches. I, I really believe that this is something that's been missing, and I think where we can make a really big difference. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to working further with the CBI on all of this. Thank you.